Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Ava Killorney Memorial Lecture. Uh, I am Diane Perrins. I'm a, mem a trustee of the Ava Killorney Memorial Trust and a professor here at the LSE. Uh, and on behalf of the Trust, I'd like to thank the Inst International Inequalities Institute uh, and the Gen LSE Gender for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Uh, but tonight I'm speaking briefly uh, as a member of the Ava, Malone, Ava Killorney Memorial Trust. Um, I had the great pleasure and privilege of working with Ava when we both taught at City of London Polytechnic, which is now London Metropolitan University. Uh, Ava was an excellent teacher, a writer, a colleague, and a friend. And she was an economist who work, whose work and, pa and passion was concerned with analysing and redressing inequality. And given the present high and rising levels of inequality and the growing levels of social deprivation and political uncertainty, it's even more important to commemorate her work. Uh, tomorrow, in this country, we perhaps have an opportunity to redress some of these inequalities, albeit perhaps in a marginal way. Anyway, as far as the trust is concerned, after Ava's untimely death in 1985, Amartya Sen established the trust to commemorate Ava's life and work and to reflect and further her belief in the possibility of social justice. And the trust manages donations we receive um, and is made up of colleagues from City of London Poly, London Met, uh, and friends and family of Ava, including her two children, Indrana and Kabir and it's chaired by Chris Elvin, who's here tonight. The principal activity of the Trust has been to award annual bursaries to, co to, ch to students of economics at London Met, uh, who are experiencing particular financial difficulties in order to help them uh, proceed and complete their degrees. Um, and times are very, very hard at present for staff and students at London Met uh, and especially for students who come from a wide variety of locations, including students who have uh, families, students who come from uh, backgrounds of, of stress and turmoil, including refugees and so on. And each year the Trust makes awards to students uh, in order, as I said, to help them finance their uh, activities and enable them to complete their degrees. The Trust also organises these lectures uh, the first five lectures in the series were published in a book, which is called Living as Equals, and it includes an essay by Amartya Sen on social commitment and democracy. And tonight we're delighted that Lord Stern has agreed to give tonight's lecture, and I'll now hand over to Nyla to introduce Nick Stern and the lecture itself. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. I should. So I shall be very short because I think uh, we have two very illustrious speakers. They don't need any introduction, but I have to go through the motions as the chair. So I will say that on my right, we have our, our main speaker, Professor Lord Stern, who has been chair of the Grantham Research Institute since it was founded. Um, he has been at the LSC for uh, a number of years. He has taught in uh, a number of other places, including Oxford, Warwick, but I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that he's also been associated with the Indian Statistical Institute in Bangalore and uh, Delhi for many years, and he is now associated with the uh, JNU in a number of ways. Uh, he was Chief Economist and Senior Vice President at the World Bank, also a major advisor at EBRD, and he was the head of the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, which I think is where his passion now is. Uh, he was knighted for services to economics in 2004, and he was made a crossbench life peer as Baron Stern of Brentford. He's published more than 15 books and 100 articles, and his most recent book is Why Are We Waiting? The Logic, Urgency, and Promise of Tackling Climate Change. He will be speaking for about 45 to 55 minutes, and then we will have uh, Professor Matthias Sen, again, who needs no introduction, but very quickly. Lamont University professor uh, at Harvard, many years at the LSE, 
you know, um, awarded a huge number of uh, awards, of, of which, of course, the best known is the Nobel Prize. So I'm going to leave it at that. And <laughs> because I would like uh, both Nick and Amartya to have uh, a lot of time. But I would just draw your attention to the hashtag for tonight, which is uh, LSE Colony, which is somewhere uh, over there, OK, for those of you who want to tweet. Uh, thank you, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Nyla. And um, the first thing you, you always have to do is to make sure that you can change the. Uh... Is there a. Is... Ah. Yes. So that was the first thing. Uh, after thanking uh, Diane and, and uh, Nyla. The second thing after that is to thank Amartya and the, uh, the Trust for the honor of giving this lecture. Those of you who've looked back to see the very distinguished people who've given it before will recognize it is indeed an honor to uh, be asked to give this, give this lecture. Thank you also to the, uh, the III and LSE gender. Um, the story I want to tell is one that for me started in 1974 um, but uh, the first study of the village of Palanpur was in 1957-58. I'll run very quickly through those who were involved, but uh, over that very long period of time, which is uh, now 60 years, we have seven studies, one for every decade since independence. So in a sense, you know, seven decades since independence, this is one of LSE's contribution to the celebration of uh, 70 years of of independence. Um, but let me run through very quickly who was involved in uh, this whole story. The very first study was in 57, uh, 58, conducted by the Agroeconomic Research Center of the University of Delhi. And the, um, uh, I think, Amartya, very soon after that, you were probably the chair of the Agricultural Economics Research Center of the University yeah. of Delhi as part of his role of professor of uh, economics in in the Delhi School. Uh, then there was another one in 62-3. Uh, Christopher Bliss and I uh, uh, went there in 1974-5. Uh, uh, I'll explain how we chose the village uh, a little in a, a little moment. Um, and we were uh, very ably assisted by S.S. Chagi Jr., who was the younger brother of S.S. Chagi Sr., who'd done the original study, and uh, V.K. V.K. Singh, both from uh, UP. And in 83-84, there was a young man called Jean Drez, who some of you probably know, who a couple of years before had come to my lectures at the Indian Statistical Institute. And uh, he, with Naresh Sharma, who's now a professor in Hyderabad, he uh, led that study, Jean and uh, Naresh. And that was a very intensive uh, set of data. Uh, they did, we did a very quick study. But by then, of course, we could do some things very quickly in 93, which, again, Jean and Naresh uh, led. And then in 2008-09, um, uh, we uh, started to work with um, Himanshu, who's a professor at JNU. And uh, he has been, as it were, the driving force, or they, as they say in India, the life force um, since, uh, since then. Um, and uh, Deepa Sinha, uh, has been, his spouse has been very much uh, involved also. And uh, since I came back to the LSE in 2007, uh, Ruth Katamuri has been an anchor here and also involved in um, Palanpur. So it's a, it's a big group. I'll show you a picture or two. But it's a big group over quite a long period of time. Now, um, this, but I first met Ava before this all started in 1968 through a mutual friend, um, Andrew Cornford in Nuffield College, Oxford, when I was uh, a graduate student. And uh, probably not many people here did meet uh, Eva, but uh, if you did, you never forgot. It was quite dazzling warmth, intelligence, uh, vibrancy. Um, I just wish I'd met her more, more often. But I'm very happy that I did meet her in, in 68 in Nuffield. And actually, by chance, it was the same year in which 
um, we first met Amartya, uh, this time through somebody else, through Sudhir Mulji, who sadly no longer with us. So I, I met Eva and Amartya totally separately um, now, uh, almost 50, 50, years, 50 years ago. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to share that memory with you. It was all too short, and uh, I wish I'd got to know her better, better, than, better than I did. Now, I've told you about seven studies. Yeah? We went back, I didn't actually mention 2015, but we went back and collected more data in 2015. So one, seven studies altogether, one for every decade since uh, independence. Now, why, may you ask, did we do this? Well, um, this is, by the way, the plan of the lecture. It covers seven decades. We're just finishing the third book. I'm going to try and do it all in the 40 minutes that uh, remains uh, to me. So I'm going to have to stay at a fairly high level, which is slightly frustrating because this is super micro. Um, this is not just an observation. This is a household and people that we know. Uh, when you run a regression and you look at the difference from some line or other, that's a person. Now, I'm going to have to be very quick, but a lot of the joy and the point of all this was to understand how people's circumstances change. So I'm going to take you through this agenda. I'm going to do it pretty fast, and I'm not going to go through all slides, but I want to leave a complete side, slide pack on the websites of the, uh, the III, LSE Gender, the India Observatory, and Sticker, so that anybody who wants to sit down and go through those slides will know that when I'm making a big statement, there are actually some detail and numbers uh, behind it, but I won't have the, ch the time to go through, uh, through all those. So we were thinking about what one village, in this case, Palanpur, could tell us about India, and of course, looking at the effect of India's growth on Palanpur. We were thinking of what one village could tell us about economic theory. When I talk about discipline here, I'm an economist. I know not all of you are economists, but this is the London School of Economics. I'm talking about the discipline. We wanted to ask what could this discipline, economic development, economic theory in general, tell us about what we find in a village? And then what, could we, what, what we found in the village could tell us about that discipline. So when I talk about India and Palanpur, it's both ways. When I talk about Siri and Palanpur, it's both ways. And our original motivation was to understand, Christopher, when Christopher Bliss and I went in 74-5, was to understand India better through the village and to um, understand economic theory better through the village. And that was, in a broad sense, our original motivation. We were a couple of economic theorists, fairly mathematical, but who wanted to... I'm a, we'd both done quite a bit of applied work before, and I looked at tea in Kenya about five years before. But basically, a pair of economic theorists trying to see what their theory could bring to these circumstances and try to learn something about the theory from those circumstances. So let me now... I'm. Um, move very quickly through the key features of change over this, um, over this period. I'll talk about growth and distribution. Very much we're concerned with the questions of the great classical economists, Smith, Ricardo, and Marx, um, were talking directly about growth and distribution. What we were trying to do was talk directly about growth and distribution. The story of growth is one where the growth of population around 2% over this uh, per annum over this period of time. Income per capita growth, just a little bit more, but also around 2%. Remember comparing with India, not so dissimilar from India in the first part of the period, but a fair bit below India's rate of growth in the second part of um, this period. The drivers of growth in the first part, the first 25 years or so, were largely the Green Revolution intensification of agriculture, particularly investment in irrigation and double cropping. But the drivers in the second part of the period, and this is fundamental and where I'll focus quite a bit today, was involvement in activities off farm, including activities outside the village. So the drivers of growth through this uh, long period were very different in the first half and the second half. And capital intensity, investment in agriculture, was an important part of releasing labour for these other activities. Poverty has declined quite strongly um, in basically real poverty line 
uh, terms, it's probably gone down from 50% to below 20% of the population in this very long uh, period. Uh, the first part of the period, not much of a trend in inequality. The second part of the period, an increase in inequality. And one of the themes, if you think of Kuznet, Simon Kuznet's story of people moving out of a backward sector into a more advanced sector, he argued that inequality would first rise. Deng Xiaoping's language was some people get richer before others. And so you would expect in this process of integration into the outside world, if you like, uh, inequality to rise. So you, this mobility, which is very important, which I'll come back to quite a bit, uh, is associated with a rise in inequality. Um, the, of course, in India, you always have to talk about between caste inequality and within caste inequality, but as is often the case, the big drivers of change in terms of inequality were movements within, within, uh, uh, within the caste. And uh, there's been some, uh, in this last uh, 20 years or so, some uh, significant increase in the living standards and opportunities uh, with the Dalit group, which is Jatabs, previously called Chamars or, or leather workers. So here's a story then of, of uh, particularly in the second half of the period, mobility, new opportunities leading to rise in uh, inequality, most of that within caste, but the role of uh, across caste uh, inequality starting finally to uh, to fall. Institutions and society, well, again, this is perhaps a bit more part of modern theory in economics. The key point I want to make is institutions matter enormously for economic activity. Zamandari abolition is a very clear example when the land went essentially from ownership by the Zamandars to the ownership by the uh, cultivators. That triggered or was associated with a very big increase in investment in agriculture. Persian wheels initially, but then that trans translated into pumping sets. Have any of you, anybody seen a Persian, anybody not seen a Persian wheel? I mean, a, a Persian wheel is a vertical set of buckets mm. in a big uh, well where people drive bullocks round and round and it lifts the water. That was the dominant form of irrigation when we first went there. That has, uh, 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 has almost completely, well, has completely gone away. And now the irrigation is through 10 centimetre uh, bores with uh, diesel pumping sets on top. A bit of electricity, but people, you know, would, electricity uh, only came about 15 years ago, and then people would steal the wires and so on. So uh, it's mostly um, diesel pumping sets. But that initial period after Zamandari ab abolition in the early 1950s did lead to strong investment in irrigation and double cropping. That was a fundamental change and clearly an institutional change triggering a big investment. But one important point that we want to make throughout is that institutions are endogenous. The way they work depends on the way in which the economy changed. The causation goes both ways. Institution to economic structure, economic structure to institutions. One very important example of that is the way the whole institution of tenancy has started to change in Palanpur. And I'll come back, uh, I'll come back uh, to that. Um, the, and our, uh, women's status in Palanpur is still pretty miserable, but um, it's changing. And I'll have a few words to, well, more than a few words to, uh, to say about that. Um, so people move up. People move up because they embrace new activities. They're entrepreneurial in that sense. People move down because their luck is bad. They start uh, quarreling within the family and suing each other or killing each other. People move down through the time-honored methods of moving down in, uh, in British aristocratic life, although there are no British aristocrats here, which is um, a drink and gambling. So people move down. Uh, through bad luck. Jean used to call it dissipation, so it's become a much loved word in the Palampur studies as people move down from dissipation. But it's also bad luck and internal family quarrelling is uh, very important. People murder e each other, um, and uh, often that's about relationships with daughters-in-law, brothers falling out when the father dies over property and, uh, and so on. So their roots down and their roots uh, up. The snakes and ladders are both ever present. So that's the, uh, those are the big picture stories that we're trying to bring some understanding to and a bit of detail uh, to. The uh, reason that we chose the village, I've already intimated it 
in a very broad sense, but we wanted to look at the Green Revolution. Remember, this is 1974. The Green Revolution has been going for a few years, lots of discussion about what its effect was on employment, income distribution, and so on. So that was a key question. If we were going to do that, we had to have somewhere that was studied before. We wanted to um, have somewhere where we could live independently of a caste, otherwise you get too much associated with one uh, particular group. And we could live in the seed store because the guy, the village level worker who did live in the seed store was allocating rationed fertilizer. If you allocate anything that's rationed, you make some money. So he was living in the nearby town, not in that place. So we could live uh, above the uh, seed store. And that's where Chris Christopher and I and uh, Chagi and Vinod uh, did live. Not too far from Delhi because we had to get there in a day because we were teaching at uh, ISI some of the time, but of course not too close because it would be uh, dominated. Uh, at that time, tenancy was a very big issue in um, economic theory, and uh, people were arguing about different series of tenancy. Some of you will know of the work of Stephen Chung, contrasted with Alfred Marshall and so on. So that was a very live issue. We wanted to have somewhere where tenancy was important. Of course, the Green Revolution was associated with wheat, largely in North India. So it had to be somewhere where wheat was dominant. Okay? And there should be nothing particularly unusual about the village. That's hard to explain, but sometimes you run into a village which is dominated by weavers or goldsmiths or or something, and uh, obviously it shouldn't be unusual in that sense. So we're actually quite, even though there's 600,000 or so villages in India, given all those layered criteria, we're probably quite lucky to find uh, one, but that was Palanpur. There it is. Um, you all know that UP is an important place, 200 million uh, people, ballpark, and that little circle is Muradabad, Muradabad district. Uh, we're about 20 miles to the east of Muradabad. The, um, <laughs> Now, let me, this, that takes you through all the surveys and tells you about them. I'm not going to go through in that detail. But final, final remarks on longitudinal studies, because if you're looking at changes of individuals, <laughs> changes of individual income, you've got to stay with it. If you're going to stay with it for a long time, now, it's, uh, I was first there in 74, so that's 43 years, you've got to start young and live long. <laughs> and find younger colleagues. We were absolutely blessed to find Jean Dres and then blessed again to find uh, him and Shu and uh, his, uh, his team. Very early advice was from the wonderful Clive Bell. You remember Clive, don't you, um, Amartya? Probably not many of you do. But Clive said, in his very posh British accent, you have to convince them, Nick, that you are mad but harmless. <laughs> and um, if you knew Clive, you would recognise that he would have been very successful in, uh, in that. And Clive did, did do a lot of work in Punia district of Bihar. And we learnt. We learnt from him. We learnt from Scarlett Epstein. We learnt from Michael Lipton. We learnt from many people who'd done uh, uh, village, uh, village studies. In fact, we went down, Christopher and I went down to see Scarlett before we went off to India uh, at all. You have to do various different kinds. I mean, we've got lots of questionnaire data, but we had uh, discussions, qualitative data, observation, and uh, so on. And of course, you can't stick narrowly to economics in those kinds of circumstances. You have to recognize yourself, as I hope we do at the LSE, as a as social, social scientist. There you are. That's the team. That's him and Shu and myself and Pete Lanyau. Pete, the three of us are leading that work, the work now and, and trying to finish this book. Um, uh, Pete was a student here at the LSE in uh, 1986, and uh, he did his thesis on Palanpur. He's now sort of a um, much older chap, of course, as we all are, and uh, he uh, is a professor at uh, Free University of Amsterdam. Him and Shu, you can see their professor at uh, J JNU. This is 2008, so it's not quite up to date with what we really look like. Uh. <laughs> this is the team. Here, more of them. Um, you can see him and Shu in the back. At the far back, you can see um, Deepa. And then in the middle back, sitting down, you can see Jean Dres. Um, and uh, this was when we were all together one time. You can see me at the front, and there's Ruth there also at the front. Right in the middle at the front is the wonderful Dinesh, who now knows the village by the back of his hand, because he stayed there for virtually full time for two years. So that's the lot. This is old and new. This is a tractor and, of course, bullocks. And you can see the children uh, at work there looking after the bullocks. 
Bullocks, of course, the, the female she buffaloes and, and cows very much in evidence doing the milk, but the bullocks are uh, out of business now because it's, uh, uh, the tractors have uh, taken over. This is, um, those are dung cakes, and you can see that's a very big part of what uh, uh, women have to do in Palanpur. This is the Employment Guarantee Scheme, which many people of you will know. That's digging ditches for the Employment Guarantee Scheme. So it's not just wasted money. Some people have been very rude about the Employment Guarantee Scheme. I think we're much less rude about that than uh, some. This is a real ditch that works, and you need ditches when uh, you have the monsoon to maintain those rural roads. Um, this is a small business economy. That's a haircut. This is the school right behind the seed store. That's the back of the seed store that you can uh, see there where we were staying. This is an unusual day because the teacher is present. So, uh, <laughs> and this is the seed store. These are all pictures from 2008. We lived at the top part of that. You wouldn't want to do that now. It's all collapsed. You know, things collapse sometimes. So uh, we couldn't stay in the seed store that we were quite happily ensconced in in 74, 75. So that's um, the, uh, I, you should, you probably noticed that most of the people in the pictures were wearing shoes. Now, my favorite development index, which I've never published, which I will sometime, is the shoe to foot ratio. And <laughs> in 1974, it would have been less than half. Uh, now it's probably 80, 90. Now, there are lots of indices of development, but that for me is a, a, pet, a pet one. And I, I haven't got, we've got in our loft um, some pictures from 74, 75, which I hope we'll dig out before we actually publish the book. You've then seen me with uh, black, rather long hair and somewhat slimmer than I am now. The, now, let's go very quickly through broad indicators of change. Population gone from about 500 and something to something like 1,300 now. Big change in uh, population, a big change in per capita income. But remember, this is a very long period of time. And uh, these growth rates are what the growth rates that uh, I indicated to you, sort of 2% or, or so. With the rise in population, land holding goes down very strongly. Gini coefficients for land owned, you know, in the 0.45 to 0.5 range, quite unequal, but no very big landowners uh, in the village. And of course, land operated is generally more equal than land owned because small people hire in uh, tenancy land and some bigger people hire it out. So that's uh, the story of uh, change in population and land. Uh, wheat yield has gone up by a factor of seven from 57 to 2008. It'd be gone up a fair bit more uh, between 2008-9 and, uh, and now. Similarly, product wages in terms of wheat per day have gone up quite a lot uh, as well. Slower increases in wheat yield in the second part of the story than the, um, than the early part. Don't get, remember that the dates here, the difference between the last two columns is quite long, that's 25 years. Um, we did have a study in 93, but the, uh, as I mentioned, the two studies, 93 and 2015, were quite light relative to uh, agriculture and, uh, and uh, income, income data. This is showing the big rise in non-farm income, and that's a very important part of the story that I've uh, emphasized already. Lots of definitions of non-farm income. This one is quite a narrow one. It would be well over 50%, around 60% if you had a broader <coughs> definition of uh, non-farm income. It's a very powerful change, and one that's getting um, still, still, more, uh, still more powerful. Um, Tenancy now. Um, I mentioned the importance of tenancy in this whole story. You can see that um, more than, for a long time now, more than 50% of the households have been involved in tenancy in or out. It's a very big part of agricultural life. It's a very big market that's very important. The market for the asset of land is very rarely operated. The market for the use of land is operated all the time, and the majority of the houses, households uh, involved, and a good third or so of the land involved in tenancy. So tenancy is a very big uh, story. Now, in this period, and it's a very important part of the process of change, um, the nature of tenancy, the formal contract has changed. Batai is sharecropping. Batai is 50-50 sharecropping. 
And you can see that that form of contract has declined. Chotai is where the um, worker gets a quarter of the output. So with Chotai, there is an incentive for the worker to take care. It's not like a cash payment because the worker gets a quarter of the output. That's the old story of um, uh, sharecropping, which, by the way, both Marshall and Chung uh, described, that you had to have incentive structures and supervision for this to operate. But you can see that Peshki, which is cash rent, has grown. Why has it moved in this direction? Well, people are becoming more and more involved in outside jobs. That means their time for supervision, and with share tenancy, as Marshall said and as Chung said, you need a lot of supervision. And uh, as your ability to supervise declines because you're more involved in external activities, the nature of the contract changes. So the way in which that key market in Palampur functions and the contractual relationships in those markets have changed endogenously as a result of the kind of economic change we've seen. That's a sense in which I've argued that institutions are endogenous. And uh, this is an important example of uh, exactly that. Now, I said we're going to place this in the, oh, I, I should just remark that every way you look at it, there's no difference, no significant difference in productivity per acre on share crop land and uh, owner farmed land. That we found, Christopher and I, in 74, 75. You still find it now. And so those ideas that you have enough supervision to make it a bit like uh, self-farming uh, and hiring and labor is still, I think, a correct interpretation. Now, I said I'd say something um, about um, the, uh, let me comment very briefly on um, the uh, human, human development. Um, you can see that, uh, uh, I'll come back to it later on, but uh, essentially, Education moved very, very slowly, but it's really picked up in the last uh, uh, decade, and I'll be, uh, I'll be coming back uh, to that. Malnutrition still pretty prevalent. This is UP, and it's a bit higher than the state average. The health facilities, public health facilities, work, um, work very badly. So I've gone very fast through changing living standards, changing productivity, changing markets, and changing human development outcomes. In both. Of course, there's cartloads more data, but I'm trying to get, take you through it in a fairly uh, high-level high level way. This is in the context of India, of course, and let me just remind you very quickly how India has changed in this time. These are Indian growth rates. How many people remember the Hindu rate of growth? <laughs> yeah, a few people remember the Hindu. The Hindu rate of growth was 3.5% overall and about 1.5% per capita. They called it the Hindu rate of growth because they couldn't really explain why it was more or less the same. I mean, you give it an adjective. But um, <laughs> you can see that uh, in the 80s, that picked up. That started to pick up with, um, the, with I think it's fair to say, uh, the various reforms, including Rajiv Gandhi and so on, and on to uh, Manmohan Singh. And uh, it's still... Um, if you like, with lots of fluctuations moving upwards, probably it's going to stabilise somewhere between 6 and uh, 7%. You know, if you're in a good mood on a good day, you might say 8%, 8 but I think we should talk about 6 7% as the kind of growth rates we should expect uh, in India. And recognising that population growth rates have been, have been dropping, that's an important story. But you can see then this is two periods. Remember, we start in 57, 58, and we have one study, 83, 84. That corresponds with the Hindu rate of growth, the first part of the period. But the second part of the period corresponds to the pickup in the rate of growth from Rajiv Gandhi's time uh, onwards. Uh, that's been very important in Palanpur, but it hasn't been um, uh, in terms of opportunities, but not yet that kind of growth rate in Palanpur. You can see it in rural uh, wages. It's still puzzling why uh, the Congress lost the election when the rural growth rates were going up so fast, but there you go, it's, they, they didn't play it very well. The, uh, you can see that in this story, uh, average growth rates of agriculture, lots of fluctuation. I mean, this is a, a country where the quality of the monsoon matters a great deal, but no big trend in the agricultural growth rate. 
What's happening here, of course, given you've got a more or less fixed amount of land, is capital intensity is moving along and you, the capital intensity is beating out the falling rate of return. So you've got uh, essentially the growth of capital keeping up the rate of growth of uh, output, but no acceleration in agricultural growth. Now, here's a very telling story for India, which is reflected strongly in Palampur. Look at which sectors have been growing and which sectors have been declining. That second batch of columns is construction and the first batch of columns is manufacturing. So the share of the major industry groups in non-farm employment in rural areas, manufacturing has been going down and construction has been going up in India as a whole. And if you ask where are these people working when they're moving outside uh, of uh, uh, agricultural non of farm activity in Palampur, a lot of it's construction or associated with construction in uh, in some way. So that's the a very fast canter through what's happened in the Indian economy over 60 or 70 years, um, but I've tried to tell it in a way which relates pretty directly to um, the Palampur story. Now, let me spend, um, uh, there are two big chunks to go before I pull, pull things together. I'll have to move fairly quickly, but one is poverty, inequality, and mobility, and the other is women in Palampur. So if we, um, if we look uh, here at, uh, at um, poverty, you can see that uh, poverty has been going down uh, it measured against a fixed real poverty line from about 50% in the 50s in Palampur down to 20% in 2008 and it would be a good bit, um, a good bit below that now. If you look, that was poverty. If you look at, and you'd expect growth to bring down poverty fractions relative to some fixed uh, real poverty line. But look what's been happening to um, the inequality. It bounced around uh, in the first part of the period. Those first four columns, if you like, are the first quarter of a century and then the difference between the last two columns are the next quarter of a century. And you see a rise in inequality bounces around for the first 25 years, but a rise in inequality, whichever, whether you do it, genies or coefficient of variation, axis indexes and indices and so on. That's a, quite a striking change. And it's the story I've already told. As you get involved in outside opportunities, that mobility brings with it an increase in inequality. Now, I'm not here to praise increases in inequality, but I, we are here to understand and in this case, they come around in part, in large part, through increased opportunities, which some people take uh, before others. The, um, this is decomposition, cultivation income, non-farm income. As non-farm income has risen, its contribution to inequality, here measured by decomposition of the Gini coefficient, has gone up. So it's not only contributing more to the average uh, income as a fraction, it's also increasing, associated with the increase in inequality. And here you see some um, reduction, this decomposed through the tile, as you have to for this kind of thing, is some reduction in uh, the between caste component of inequality. So non-farm income uh, driving up inequality, but some reduction in between caste, but a strong within caste inequality, again, within a caste. Some people take opportunities. Uh, before others. Now, if you like your transition matrices, these are the people moving from across quintiles. You, you, you can't read it where you are. I'm going to tell you what's here. What you're seeing is an increase in the weight off the diagonal in these transition matrices. You have to take my word for it because you can't see it, but you will have access to the table so you can check it yourself. There's been increase in the off diagonal weights. In that sense, that is an increase in um, mobility. But that is looking at person A in one year and person A, or household A, in the next year. That's what we say intergenerational. But if you look, and I'll show you the number in just a moment, if you look what's happening between um, the head of, it's, well, it's basically father and son, because in this society it's father and son who are the heads of the households. If you look at it, through these big 25-year changes, two lots of 25-year changes, there's some sign that the um, in 
intergenerational, not the intragenerational, intergenerational mobility has been going down. And that's very interesting. And if you look at the bottom line here, if you actually just look at the two numbers in the bottom right-hand corner, 0.294 and 0.441, that is a regression of uh, son's income on father's income. And you can see that the strength, the coefficient in that, or the log of, the strength of that coefficient has gone up over time. And that's, I think, very interesting. It suggests that when these new opportunities come along, some people take them. But the probability of taking them is influenced by where you come from. So that's interesting, then. You get the intragenerational mobility moving up, but the intergenerational mobility moving down. It moves down 0.294 to 0.441, says that in the second half of the period, the move from the, uh, the second half to the end of the period, that the strength of the coefficient on father's income is more than it was previously. So that's decline in intergenerational mobility. And I think it, we're still digging, but I think it comes about for the reasons I described. New opportunities, intragenerational mobility goes up but the probability of being able to take those uh, is better for if your father's richer, and that means that uh, intergenerational ability goes down. If you want to think about those numbers, I'm referring a lot to Tony Atkinson today, and he was a dear, dear friend of many of us and sadly died on the first day of this year. But uh, Tony and, uh, and Alan Maynard and Chris Trinder did a famous study when they found some data in York across generations. And there, interestingly, their coefficient was quite similar to 0.4. So this was York in the early part of this century, uh, early part of last cent century, but they found a similar coefficient. And their coefficient of 0.4, because they also had the height of the father and the height of the son, the coefficient on the income relationship was quite close to the coefficient on the height relationship. I think that's a good way of getting a hand, handle on it because you would normally expect tall fathers to go with tall sons. No surprise there. But actually, the strength of that relationship is quite similar between height and income in Tony's data. We couldn't replicate that, but we could do something that he couldn't do, and that is we can look at the change of that across generations because we've got two generations. This is the only study I know that's got... I mean, John Hills and the International Equality Institute probably helped me on this, but we're able to do it across two generations. So it's not just the coefficient. We can say, how has that coefficient changed? So that's a big part of the uh, story. Now, let me move very quickly to saying something uh, about um, women in Palampur, because I'm, and there, I'm leaning very heavily on the work of Deepa Sinha here. In the early studies, I mean, to our discredit, but it was a fact, we didn't have any women on the team. But we, in 2008-10... Of course, we were going back to it after quite a long period. We worked very hard to have more women on the team. And of course, women can talk to women in a way that men can't talk to women in an Indian uh, village. So what we're saying here is uh, richer in the later part of the period than it was in the first. But of course, you've got literacy rates and so on. It's a very interesting story here. You can see that literacy for women in the early part of the period was essentially zero in 1950. Eight. Well, it's way above zero now, and you can see that the gap, the dotted green line between men and women, has finally started to turn down. So this last decade has been very important in Palampur, and I think India more generally. Finally, finally, uh, the girls are going to uh, school. This is um, by uh, age group, so um, if you uh, look at... Uh, this is 2009 data. If you look at the very last column here, the very last column, seven to ten-year-olds are nearly of, of um, seven to ten-year-olds of girls are um, seven, seventy percent of the seven to ten-year-old girls are literate. But if you look at 25 and above, it's 11 percent. Something's going on here. Right? The girls have finally started to uh, go to school. And if you look at the very bottom row of this matrix here, looking over the years, this now just 1984 to 2015, then you can see the Jatab, which is, as I said, the Dalit Chamar group, um, have moved from 15% in 
sorry, from naught. Look at girls in bottom row. It's moved from naught to over 50%. It's finally, finally changing. This is a very important uh, trend now in Palampur, which we would argue have very strong influence in, uh, in, what's, uh, in what's coming, what's coming uh, next. Uh, fertility rates, well, we didn't have formal tracking of annual births and deaths. We were going there every 10 years. So you can't note every birth and death in 10 years because you have to do that virtually by the month if you're going to track it properly. But you can do some surrogates. And if you look, it's, really, it's, it's very striking here too. If you look at children under 15 per adult woman, that's dropped strikingly between 93 and 2015. If you look at the number of children aged uh, one um, per women in reproductive age group, again from 1993, that's dropped very dramatically. Finally seeing fertility rates in that sense. Not direct measurement, but uh, I think very strong uh, indication. So um, let me, um, there you can see, if you look at the bottom line here, that um, some increase in women working outside the home, but still very small relative to the total number of, um, of women. In 2009, something like 20%, up from pretty negligible in 1958. Interestingly, that started to fall, and that is in large measure uh, girls staying on at school. So that fall, 71 to 40, not a bad thing. That's uh, another reading on um, um, more girls over 15 being uh, in education. This is what women can and can't do. Again, no time to go through it in any detail. But basically, if you ask in this second uh, block, what can a woman do on her own? And um, essentially moving around inside the village, some opportunities. Um, you can go to the village temple, but you can't go to a nearby shrine outside the village on your own. So 70% can go to a village temple, but only 20% to a nearby shrine. If you go to the health centre outside the village, that's very different from going to um, the village doctor. Well, village doctor is a rather polite name for what goes on in the village, but the, uh, um, you can see that moving outside the village is still very uh, restricted. Um, women do spend money, but they don't have land in their own name, and they don't have banks or post office accounts in their own name. Changing, but still, still very limited. So let me come to my last parts of the story. I'm going to say something about policy and something about the future, and something about theory, and I'm going to do it fast. Um, policy in agriculture, it's hard to point to priorities for policy in agriculture. Markets don't work too badly. People do find out about uh, cropping techniques. Agricultural extension, not very good. Fertilizer is still subsidized, that's pretty daft. Um, but if you're looking for priorities for reform within agriculture, I wouldn't underline all that much. Not because it's perfect, because if you think of things you'd like to do, like better agricultural extension, uh, India's shown how bad it is at doing that over a long period of time, and uh, flicking your fingers and changing that overnight isn't something that I can imagine. But if you, if you could, you would, but uh, it would be tough. But policy on human development and protection really does matter. You've seen that uh, education and health improving, but still very poor. And the public institutions for delivery of that are still very weak. So in our view, this is a key area for uh, policy. Again, nutrition, uh, school meals are very erratic. The public distribution system doesn't work uh, that well. And of course, um, inside toilets, which are a very big part of nutrition, only just beginning. Maybe 5% or so households finally have toilets attached. The big majority um, defecate in the fields. So here are big areas for policy around human development. I already praised the employment guarantee scheme in that little picture I told you of ditch digging. And that seems to me, of course, it's not just the ditches that are dug, it's the uh, 100 rupees a day, or a bit more now, that you get for uh, doing that and some guarantee of a certain number 
of days. So I wouldn't go in deep on policy on agriculture, but policy on human development and human protection, I think the experience of Ballonport does indicate uh, a strong priority. Similarly, infrastructure. Infrastructure is a very big part of the health story. It's a very big part because you know, burning things inside huts as opposed to using solar power is a very big difference to health. Of course, water and sanitation, a very big difference to health. And given the story I've told about Palanpur integrating with the outside economy, the mechanisms are very important. If you want to go and move bags in the rail yard at Muradabad, which is an important part of the story, you go as a team. You need a mobile phone because somebody's going to ring up and say, can you put a team together for moving the goods in the rail yards in Muradabad tomorrow? You, that's about an hour and a half each way. You're not so keen to do that if you're not sure of the job. But if you are sure of the job, it makes a very big difference. And that's been a very important part of the story of um, outside employment. So the whole story of, of broadband telecoms does matter. Uh, incidentally, the telephone connection on my mobile phone um, in Palanpur is a bit better than it is in the, di the village we live in in West Sussex. Um, but there's still lots more, to be, uh, lots more to be done. So what's going to happen next? Well, employment, <coughs> the commuting story will increase. And eventually, and it's just beginning to happen, people will migrate. And you've just seen the pickup in education. I think these are the two most important stories of where Palampur is going next. Got to be careful with these because in, 19, um, in the 1974 study, Christopher Bliss and I predicted correctly that rice would increase, a more water-intensive crop, and agriculture would get more mechanised. That was a pretty easy bet, actually. <laughs> but in 83, as formal outside employment was going up, we predicted that formal outside employment would go up. Wrong. It's been much more informal employment. Um, I think agricultural markets and the rural-urban linkages will uh, get uh, still stronger, and I think finally greater access to education amongst women and lower caste might start to change the political structures uh, in Palampur. They've been pretty weak and unresponsive. Um, so finally, let's talk about theories of development. Well. The story of people moving outside an agricultural sector into other sectors, you might say, well, I've heard that before. That was Arthur Lewis and uh, Simon Kuznets and so on. And yes, that dual economy story is a helpful one. But the way it's told often, at least for Palantor, is dead wrong. What has mattered is not, commute, not migration, not people moving out. It's been commuting. It's not been changing from this job to that job. It's been the mix of what you do that's changed. This isn't an agriculture that is just passive with not much going on. Investment in agriculture has been a very important part of change and in releasing labour. And underlining, you know, I've got it in bold italic here, informal is normal. 20-some years ago, people were talking about formal jobs, full-time jobs. That's the story of change. Well, it isn't in this part of the world. And if you insist that everything is formal, you'll kill things off. Informal is normal. That's a part of people finding new opportunities. A bit here, a bit there, scratching around, but they find them. And it's very important that we understand that. And there, I think, some of our theories that we've had about dual economy models have been taken far too literally. Of course, it is a movement, but it happens in a way which is not like the way in which most of those are, are told. Agriculture, well, I don't, you know, there was, a, there was a time, many, some of you at least will remember, when um, Ted Schultz, Stephen Chung, told us that neoclassical economics is alive and well and living in the Indian village. Well, wouldn't go quite that far. But it's still true that the kinds of markets that we're talking about uh, do function one way or the other. There's monopoly in credit markets. Institutions matter. Um, information is very important to the story. But I think in terms of agriculture, our economic theories don't do uh, too badly. The mobility story I've emphasised very strongly. Mobility upwards 
is linked to opportunity. And mobility has been linked to increase in inequality. You wouldn't want to cut people off from the new opportunities because for a while the society becomes more unequal. This isn't in praise of inequality. It's trying to understand how things happen and how changes, changes occur. Um, downward mobility, I've already said, it's bad luck, it's family quarrels, uh, sometimes poor credit-funded investment, and what Jean charmingly calls uh, dissipation. But in this process of understanding mobility, we start to have to look at why is it that some people take opportunities before others? Partly I've already alluded to, it's, these are not, nobody is privileged in Palampur, it's a very poor society. But if your family is a bit better off, you have a bit better chance of finding these things. But there's a huge noise and variation. And some people are quicker at taking these opportunities than others. And Nani, who's a, a tele, uh, tele household, which is a Muslim household in Palampur, started as an agricultural labourer, started to work outside on uh, fixing motorbike, motorcycles, motorbike, motor, motor, motorcycles, motorcycles. Then he um, started up his own shop, fixing motorcycles. Then he bought a crushing mill for Mensa. Um, and he's actually doing pretty well. He's a good old-fashioned entrepreneur that uh, saved with some of his agricultural labour and started going in this direction. So you get people who spiral downwards and you get people who come upwards. Understanding the way in which that entrepreneurship works is, I think, very important. Easier to understand how people go down than how people go up. And that, it seems to me, is a very important uh, research area. I've emphasised the importance of the endogeneity of institutions. I've emphasised that the public institutions are weak and social pressure in Palampur is weak. And it's very important to try to understand why is that the case. Inequality sometimes explains weakness, but it's weak in Palampur, whichever way you look at it. And I think we've got some ideas, but that's a very interesting part of the story. But it's not absent. Eventually, I was walking down Whitehall about um, eight or nine years ago, and a text came in from Himan Chu saying the Pradhan has been impeached and the headman had been thrown out. And his behaviour was so outrageously bad, he made off with the school dinner money, school lunch money. People got more and more cross, and eventually they threw him out. So when I'm describing a rather passive politics and social organisation in Palawa, that doesn't mean it's zero. Sometimes people are so outraged that um, they, they throw the rascals uh, out. And Palampur has actually voted more or less with the majority in Indian elections ever since we've been uh, going there. So that's the story. Uh, I wanted to finish in praise of longitudinal village studies. Um, I've got to the point where I don't trust anybody's data unless you've actually collected it yourself. A two-week survey um, I have little faith in. And it, you know, it takes you a long time to find out what's really going on. You've got to check both sides of the transaction. Who's renting in, who's renting out. One guy says this, the other guy says that. You've got to go and have a look, see what's actually happening on uh, that land. Now, I don't want to be too negative about survey data. You know, you, you've got to have it. But I worry a bit about its quality after comparing it with uh, the very detailed uh, story. But I do think that this very long-run view is what development economics is about. Surely we're trying to understand how societies change, why some people move faster than others, what are the drivers of change, how do those institutions work? And close study of one place, in my view, beats big data sets and uh, huge regressions. I don't want to do too much of a horse race. In fact, I, I shouldn't do a horse race between them. What I do want to say, because we need them, but what I want to say is that these kind of long-run studies with great detail, knowing people, watching how it happens, is absolutely critical to understanding how change takes place. Now, we're very fortunate now in having seven surveys, I and mean, I've been directly involved in five. We're very fortunate in having seven surveys. It's hugely time intensive. I mean, climate change does consume me, but this is the most important part of my research life and has been for a very long time. It's hugely time intensive. You can't have whole bagfuls of these. But I do think it's very important to do them. So um, 
start young and live long <laughs> and find young friends. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> So um, I'd like to invite Professor Sen. Would you come up? I'm going to move up. That was a terrific presentation. I should have said that in 1974, when we were just beginning, um, and we took a break in Calcutta at Christmas, Amartya, in that very few months of that study, took uh, Sue and myself to a Chinese lunch on Christmas Day. In, uh, <laughs> so uh, Amartya's, in a sense, been involved in all this right from the beginning. Yeah. Well, I, any time a Chinese lunch produces work of this kind, <laughs> I'm ready to, to, um, to make my contribution. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how wonderful the talk was. Learned a great deal from it. As for someone who has read these books, it's, it's uh, particularly interesting to see how... Uh, these are quite gigantic volumes, by the way. So how... Uh, the, uh, one of the principal authors think about that. But I'd also like to say how grateful uh, I am and the others in the Eva Colonia Memorial Trust are for Nick's agreeing to give this talk uh, and giving it such, such a beautiful and such an illuminating talk. Uh, Nick is one of my favorite economists <laughs> because he fits into one general theory I have, which is that you may be a very good economist in a particular field. And in Nick's case, this would apply to development, it would apply to environment, or it would apply to poverty, and many other subjects. But in order for that to function in a way that's altogether satisfactory, you have to be uh, good and and and, and uh, general economist, and uh, Nick is of course a great general economist, and I think that's reflected as you saw from detailed observations that uh, Nick made, and going through the tables and then looking back at them. But let me ask a, a few questions. Um, one of them is that the idea of village studies now the importance of it you have established here. But when you started, that wasn't a common thought. Economists don't think like that. They think that this should be done by anthropologists. <laughs> it's quite common. I had a student, quite a brilliant student called Felicia Now, who uh, worked on um, the economic life of street children in Colombia. And she went to a number of economists, and they all told, oh, yes, economic life of street children is not a subject for the economics. It is for the sociology department. So you ought to go there. Eventually, I'm happy to say she did do uh, a brilliant thesis on that. If for the economic department, I was privileged not only to supervise her, but also to learn from it. Now, we all learn from what um, uh, Nick and uh, Christopher Bliss and, 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 and Roald Reyes and others have done. Um, the, but when you first took this on, I mean, I mean, how did this rather implausible, quote unquote, idea germinate in your mind? I mean, I knew you then, and over the Chinese lunch we had other discussions, I guess. <laughs> but I, I don't think I fully appreciated how it is that you're taking on something which will be going straight against the fashion, not just of uh, Cambridge or Oxford economics at that, or LSE economics at that time, but will go against uh, much of the instinct uh, of economists, especially who were um, analytically skilled economists that you were and 
Chris Wald and John Wald um, would like to do. So can you tell us a little bit on the gossip side of the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, whilst you know, Chris and I and John wouldn't offer ourselves up, and him and Shu as anthropologists, I mean, we're economists and trained economists, we went out of our way to talk to lots of um, sociologists. So we spent some time in the sociology department at, at the University of Delhi. Um, our great mutual friend, sadly no longer with us, Dharma Kumar, introduced us to many, many of them. And they were very helpful in guiding us. Um, of course, first and foremost, it's, it's the Indian anthropologists who know far more than those outside. Um, but if you think of Scarlett Epstein, who we went to see, um, and she gave us very helpful advice. You know, Arthur Lewis would thought of himself, you know, one of our great LSE, like you, Amartya, one of our great LSE treasures and Nobel Prizes. Arthur Lewis thought of himself as both uh, economist and sociologist. There's a wonderful book by Bailey called Cast and the Economic Frontier. So um, both both outside India and inside India, um, I think the link between anthropologists and economists has not been absent. It's not been nearly as strong as I think it should be, but it's not been Yeah, not I, been it's absent. interesting. Can I say it, yeah. raise a question on and I'll that. come back to about why we did it, but I was, the first no, one was then about... Let's hear it. Yeah. And I have a question to ask you about that, Lewis, but because yeah. I, I don't think that he really did any anthropological <laughs> work of this kind. He, 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 threatened, oh, he threatened to do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you knew him personally much better than I did. He wrote in a way that uh, tried to include... I mean, if you look at the... Um, the 1955 book, Theory of Economic Growth, there's a lot about the qualitative nature of uh, society and our city communities. I, want to, I do want to hear what you did okay. manage to say because <laughs> I interrupted. But but I'm, the, I'm quite I, happy. I mean, that, that standard in economics, though. Marshall did it. Yeah. Uh, even Edward did it. Mm. Uh, so okay. the unusual feature is that you actually did it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the famous story that um, Bob Solo tells about um, Nicky Caldor, and uh, it, it, it is relevant, so I'm going to tell it. Um, that uh, Nicky told the story to Bob about uh, how uh, he used to um, think about agriculture in Hungary. And apparently he wrote a piece saying the average size of a holding in, uh, in Hungary at this time in the 1930s was this much. And he got a letter from somebody who's been crawling all over the data and uh, trying to find out really reliable data on holdings, and he hadn't been able to do it. And he said, Dear Professor Caldor, could you kindly explain uh, how you... I'd be very interested in see." And Nicky wrote back saying that... Um, and uh, I can see his daughter is uh, here. Uh, I went to Nicky's lectures, as you know, <laughs> Mary. But um, uh, Nicky said, Well, you know... Uh, I used to go out for drives with my father um, uh, out into the countryside. And I tell you that the average side of a holding was... <laughs> and yeah. I, I know that in economics there's what we call casual empiricism. Um, um, but we were motivated to... And maybe some of the characters... Maybe Arthur Lewis is like that. I don't want to. He was such a wonderful guy, as was Nicky. Well, I wasn't deceiving. He's a wonderful oh, no, guy. No. <laughs> but you, why do you actually go and do it? Well, at that... There are a number of reasons which interwove, but at that time, there was very intense discussion, and you'll remember it well, Amati, because you were very much involved in this kind of discussion, about how markets for land and labour functioned in rural India and how they functioned in villages. Lots of discussion about tenancy, lots of discussion about uh, efficiency wages, uh, lots of discussion about uh, how distributions of risks were allocated in these kinds of markets. So both Chris and I were very interested in that kind of theory. So we had a theoretical motivation for trying to understand how those things work. Secondly, we had this... Uh, again, you've got to think back, this was... You know, we started to talk about it in the early 1970s. The romantic attraction to India for, for Brits was still quite powerful. And I hope it is still 
powerful. But there was that, we, we grew up on Indian stories. And in Christopher's case, actually, his, his, uh, his parents spent time in Darjeeling and he went back to, to see that. So the first one was the, the theoretical story. The second one was India and that, the romantic side, if you like. Um, and the third one was there was a growing disenchantment with big, ambitious macro planning. You, know, you remember, again, this was the 70s. The collapse of planning, planning in India restarted in the 60s. And what we didn't want to do was what our supervisors had done and go and build yet more Indian planning models. So it was a kind of negative. We knew what we did not want to do. So we wanted to go to... Kind of push for yeah. So we wanted to go to India because we loved the idea. We wanted to work on these issues because that's where a lot of theory was taking place. And we didn't want to do what the previous generation has done because that was already breaking, breaking up. Now, is that powerful enough to explain what we really did? Well, I guess it is because we did. But um, <laughs> I don't know how convincing that story is. Uh, it does. <laughs> Can I go on quickly to another issue? Yes. Um, Inequality, one of the th you know, the, among the many interesting things emerging, is the behavior of inequality, rather stationary to start with, and then then actually going up, and you relate it to opportunities uh, seized by some, not by others, and uh, I've got two concerns there. One is that. Um, it's not clear to me that inequality of income is such an interesting thing to look at um, uh, in terms of, I mean, if you, for example, if you compare China with India, the levels of income inequality are much the same. And yet the lives of the poor in China, having reasonably good school, accessible, reasonably good hospital treatment, completely immunized, and so on, is radically different from that of the poor Indians. And that you wouldn't capture at all. Now, you, of course, have brought that in, no. into the story. But should you not integrate it even more? Because the opportunity differences, you, you said, you even say that some of them are quicker at it than others, and, and you abstain, as it were, from providing an explanation. Yeah. The I wonder how much of the explanation can be provided by the basic differences in schooling and healthcare that affects that influences because if you look at the inequalities there is a pattern of continuity in it from the past and the it's the public services you absolutely did emphasize yeah. that aspect and but maybe you should have gone further to yes. relate it to the opportunity seizing story yes um th there's more um the um <coughs> we did because of the fluctuations in outcomes, particularly in an agri a society where agriculture is very important and a lot of Im that nearly all employment is casual. The fluctuations in outcomes do matter. So we had a number of different kinds of measures and we had this idea of mean income, which was the sort of income that you would realize if you had data over, say, 10 adjacent years. and. Um, Jean and Naresh uh, had a go at that, and so did uh, him and Shu and uh, collaborators. So what they tried to do, and this is very dependent on knowledge of households, try to say how well off is that household, and they rank them according to uh, yeah. broad indicators. You would look at some knowledge of how their incomes had uh, had moved. You would only wouldn't have an awful lot on that, but you would be able to look at their assets. You would be able to look at uh, how the uh, children uh, were dressed. You would be able to look at what they used to give to the temple. Signs of status. Uh, and we did actually score very carefully. And that was the best way, I think, that uh, we could get at these more permanent stories of income. Uh, the ones, the, the detailed data that I gave today were focused on income in a particular year. Yeah but we have a lot of data where we tried oh, yeah, very yeah. hard okay. to get at that, uh, to get at that uh, part of the story. On education, I think it's fair to say that up to about eight or nine years ago, education didn't seem to make <coughs> much difference to anything. You couldn't pick it up 
in the um, uh, the embracing of new techniques in agriculture. You couldn't really pick it up in the <coughs> outside jobs. So what we're saying is that what we're observing um, is not yet powerfully influenced by uh, education. But you sure what I said at the end is that we think now that will change very fast. Um, so uh, wha as you see, you know, now a majority of young girls, even at the bottom end of the caste distribution, being educated in part, I mean, educated very badly, but at least... Uh, they can find their name. Yes. Yeah. Um, now you're going to start to see uh, education play a much more powerful role. But it's very interesting that up to now, it really uh, didn't. Health status, of course, can knock you out completely, and yeah. that, really, that really does matter. Malnutrition has, uh, has mattered to the fortunes of uh, households. But what we're saying now is that looking back, not much importance in education. Looking forward, and it's already beginning a great deal. Uh, there, there's probably more to add to that in addition to what you already said. Yeah. I mean, this I found that was from about three PhD students of mine in, 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 in Delhi School of Economics. Yeah. Most, of my, most things that I've learned, I've learned by telling clever PhD students to work on it and tell me what they found. Uh, <laughs> and so this was one of the things that turns out is that, you see, the Indian, they, they learn very little in, in, in these schools. Mm. They can sign their name. And uh, mostly uh, the, the, the test that we did in the Patichi class that I started with my Nobel money, I mean, we found that even after five years of education, they can't add and so on. Mm. It's incredible. But they could get together somewhere. And that's why this idea of computer-based home learning is such a terrible thing. You have to get them out of the house. I mean, they, yeah. one of the things that emerged initially by uh, a chap called Dimitri Chaudhry's thesis in, in 64, I think, it's, it's just that even if the quality of education is terrible, you're getting out of the home making people with completely different background, mm. different caste, different religion, different community, has a broadening impact. And some of it is not education, but the act of education in the, in the schooling, which is an important thing. I agree. I mean, I, I see John Hill there, that the, uh, the Inequality uh, Institute uh, has to look at the, those actions also. Uh, how much are we, are we going to finish up? Are really at eight or? We have to finish at eight, but I thought you might have another question. I have a question, but so have all these people. I, I have an observation to make. Do you know when the biggest rise in income in, in growth rates in India took place? It depends what it depends what period you look at, but uh, the nineteen eighties was very powerful. In well, terms let me of tell you where the biggest rise was. In the. <laughs> in, in the first half of the 20th century, India's growth rate was 0.05% a year. That is uh, like near zero. <laughs> and then it became very low, the so-called Hindu rate of growth, 3%. Now from zero to 3% is a monumental increase. Three to eight percent. Oh, yes, it's mere doubling or tripling. Now, actually, there is a, a, an interest. I'm not suggesting we discuss that now, yeah. but I'm announcing it. And, and your kind of study might help to do it because something happened in that period. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the mere lack of a British Empire wouldn't do it because there was nowhere. I mean, the British were not very handy friendly for economic growth, but they were not suppressing it in any way. Yeah. It's not that the lid was taken out. Something else happened in the period, so that 3%, by the way, 3% in Europe would be regarded as a fabulous growth rate today. So that this wasn't, we shouldn't dismiss that, though must, we must pursue the way you do, namely how this big change took place to eight and a half. In the 1950s, when it moved to uh, income per capita, started growing at 2%, which was a big, a big change, big, big income change, per capita, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, that yeah, was, because that's that, almost 4%, yeah. That was, that was large measure, in my view, Zamandari abolition, which yeah. led to uh, investment in Persian wheels, which led to double cropping. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's exactly right. One will be successes in that's, in Indian, the that's Indian public policy, yeah? yeah. Zamandari abolition. Yeah, well sometimes it happened accidentally, namely it, <laughs> in Bangladesh it happened because the the Hindu were landlords there, even though they the king was Muslim, there was no discrimination against the Hindus, and most of the landlords, in fact, were Hindus. So with partition, they all left, and East Pakistan managed to get a, a land reform done without actually an economic <laughs> policy. <laughs> but I, uh, before, I, I don't think we'll have time for questions, but I'd like to end with a question, which follows up a little bit from what Amartya started out with, and that is the uniqueness of uh, an economist doing this very detailed village work over many decades. And I think for those of us who actually like to go in depth into something, into a case study, what we often hear is how representative is that. Hmm. So do you ever hear that about Palanpur? You know, yeah, all are the, you talking all the time, about yeah. some atypical village and yeah, yeah. how representative is it? There are about 600,000 villages yeah. in India. This is one, right? <laughs> so there's, we've never offered it as the representative village. But it's not peculiar in any way. You know, it's not totally dominated by one group or one kind of activity. As, as I tried to show, changes in Palanpur in broad aggregate indicators, not so very different from um, a UP average, which is a bit below uh, an Indian average. UP is a, a very weak state in terms of performance on virtually every dimension that you look at, and Palanpur is below average for UP. They tried to stop us going to Palanpur because they said, no, yeah, you, you're going somewhere that's doing much better. So we said, no, no, we, we've got these earlier studies which are very good, and that's why we want to go to Palanpur. So I don't want to say it's representative, but I, I would say it's not peculiar, and its movements are not so far away from what you'd see in a backward part of UP. But that's not represent. That doesn't mean representative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our time, uh, and I'm very glad that we had Amartya to be able to uh, ask Nick some questions. Um, so thank you both extremely, uh, a great deal. And uh, what I would request is that people stay seated until the speakers have left the room. And uh, let's give them another round of applause. <laughs>